PCR is perhaps the most useful thing uh, you can learn in a molecular biology lab. It's uh, the core of many other methods. It ends up being fairly useful in a fairly diverse number of processes. And um, you'll, uh, you'll really be very useful to the lab if you can do it uh, because we use it for a lot of things. All right, so uh, enough of that. Let's just get into it. So PCR stands for um, polymerase. And we talked about what polymerase is uh, yesterday. It's an enzyme that makes a nucleic acid, so in this case DNA, um, a nucleic acid polymer, that is, with DNA, and then polymerase chain reaction. All right, and this chain reaction thing sounds much more exciting than it actually is. Um, it basically means that the product of one reaction will go into being the substrate for the next reaction, or said in a really simple way, um, it means that uh, it's a multiplicative reaction. It means that it's exponentially growing. So rather than, uh, if this is time, making you know more and more template over time, each stage the template becomes used to make more the next time. So it doubles every time you actually go something like this. And you get exponential growth in the amount of DNA that you're getting. All right, and so that all is very abstract. So let's just talk about exactly what happens. So to do PCR, you need a number of things. First thing you need is you need polymerase. All right, so you need polymerase. That's item number one. And this obviously is the core thing that you need to make DNA, make a DNA copy of another bit of DNA. That's very straightforward. The second thing that you need is you need something to copy. You need, and we call that a template, right? So you can't just make DNA out of the blue. You need something that you're trying to copy. So you you need a template, uh, right? So the polymerase. This is like some kind of a globby molecule that does. A uh, bit of protein that does the polymerase job, and usually we use a very specific polymerase, but I'll get to that in a minute. You need a template, so I'm just going to draw a little strand of DNA. This is going to be my little, this is going to be my uh, my little DNA strand here, template. And the third thing you need is you need raw nucleotides, right? So because the the new the new temp the uh, copy that we're going to make on this template has to be made of individual nucleotides and. We don't make those from scratch. We just give the reaction nucleotides. All right, so we give it the individual units of DNA to put together into a strand of DNA. All right, so we have polymerase, template, nucleotides. And uh, this sort of seems like maybe it should be all you need, but remember that polymerase also needs that primer. We talked about the primer aspect of polymerase, how it needs something to sort of extend off of. And so these are little tiny strands of DNA, and we actually we make these synthetically. So these are primers. Okay, so that's another thing that we need. And then there's 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 two more things that we need that you really would not think that you need, but uh, it just turns out that we have to make this reaction since it's we have to have a buffer, and the buffer is usually water plus uh, like. Uh, something that keeps the pH stable, because remember the cellular pH is not 7 or 6 or anything, it's like 7.4. So the cells need to, it, you need to create an environment that looks like the inside of the cell so that the polymerase is happy. Because this polymerase, remember, is really just a molecule and it can take on all kinds of different shapes. And the shape that you want, the shape at which it works, is the one that's highly evolved to the specific situation of being inside of a cell. Alright, so we have H2O, and we need to keep pH stable, and uh, that's it. And then there's this weird requirement, which we're not going to talk about, which is you need magnesium ions. You just do, and we usually use magnesium chloride. So uh, this is an ingredient that uh, the polymerase needs as a uh, cofactor to keep it working properly. And again, this is something that's available in a cell, and it just makes it work well and fast in a um, non-cellular environment, in a test tube, because we're going to do all this in a test tube. So the, we're going to go through a series of steps uh, to make the PCR reaction work. And the first step is we're just going to take the template, and we're going to do what's called anneal the primer to the template. That might have two ends. Anneal? Hmm. I think that's right. Anneal the template to the 
primer. So remember, the primer is a little tiny strand of DNA, and it has a sequence that's complementary, so like G, A, C, dot, dot, dot. It's usually about 20 nucleotides long, plus or minus, and it's complementary to some spot on this template. So let's just say that it's right here, right? So then we have the template anneals. It means it has a hydrogen bonding that causes it to sit in and form some double-stranded DNA right here, right here where the um, right here where it's complementary. Okay, so now that's annealing. So what we get out of the annealing step, and this happens at about maybe 60 degrees Celsius. So we, we put this reaction at 60 degrees Celsius, we get annealing. Then we have a little spot that's double-stranded. Then we run, uh, we um, uh, extend. This is called an extension reaction at 72 degrees Celsius. And what that means is that the polymerase at 72 degrees Celsius gets on here. And you may be curious why it's 72 degrees Celsius, because that's kind of hot, but I'll tell you in a minute. And uh, it gets on here, and it extends this strand all the way down as far as it can go. And it makes a copy of all this downstream sequence here, right? So the primer started out being just this, but now it's been extended to be this distance here. So this whole block has been copied, okay? And then after extension, we have uh, another step, um, which is uh, the opposite of annealing and that's denaturing. And that happens usually at like 95 degrees Celsius, so quite hot. And so what that means is that we dissociate this copy strand, so this is going to be the copy, from the template strand, right? Because at very high temperatures, these two strands of DNA, they actually can't stay together. They, uh, they melt from each other, it's denaturing and they separate. And then we're going to go back to the beginning. We're going to anneal again. So what that means is, and I'm just going to draw this out, so then we have our, we have this strand here again, this template. We anneal on another primer and we extend it out and then we denature it off again. So you can imagine if we do this say 40 times, going through this cycle 40 times, then we would make 40 copies of, of, uh, of this, this sequence right here, between here and here on the template. Okay, but we don't want 40 copies. 40 copies is all well and good, but we're actually a little bit uh, greedy. We want more than 40. What about 2 to the 40th power? And I'm not going to try to calculate that, but it's a big number, uh, somewhere between, I guess, uh, 10 to the 10th and... Uh, like 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10th and 10 to the 14th or something somewhere between those two numbers I don't know exactly which and the but the point of all that is is that uh, we, we want much much more than just 40 copies we want this many copies so how can we do that well here's the trick that we're gonna use the trick is when we made this copy here off of this strand we actually got an, this copy here, but remember that this is um, what's called anti-sense. It's the backwards version, right? It's like the mirror image of this, this, this sequence right here. And you'll notice that if we try to anneal our primer right here to this, it's not gonna, it's not gonna actually complement it, it's gonna match it. And remember there's this strange thing in DNA where, you know, G bonds to C, but G doesn't bond to G right? You have to have this sort of anti-sense uh, copying. You have to have this complementarity, uh, not identical uh, sequences. So that's, that's the little wrinkle. So we actually can't copy the copy under this scheme. So we're going to add another, another bit to the, to the sequence, and I'm going to show you that right now. So I'm going to show you the little bit of uh, addition that we make to make this work. So starting from the beginning, we have a template template strand. We're going to have the primer anneal to it. This is going to be annealing. And then we're going to extend. I'm going to draw these out in a little bit shorter form. So you have a template and you have an extended copy like this. But remember it's complementary. It's not identical. It's complementary. 
So you have this complementarity here, and you have the sequence here. And then we're going to denature. And that's going to separate our copy off. Okay, so now we have these two separated sequences. But now, so the next time we anneal, we're going to use a little trick. We're going to include not just a primer on this end of the sequence we want to amplify, but we're going to also include a primer on this end. And rather than make a, com a complementary primer, we're going to make one that's identical. So if this primer goes this way and is complementary to the sequence, this uh, primer is going to go that way and is actually going to be identical to the sequence, which means that it'll be complementary to the copy. Okay, and if that's a little bit confusing, just kind of like puzzle through it and try and think about it for a little while. Maybe uh, ask me some questions if you need to. That's totally fine. But the idea is one primer is identical to the template and one is complementary. And you'll notice that the sequence you want to amplify is in between those two. So this, this actually allows this sort of brilliant magical thing to work out. So now the next time we anneal, we have our template here annealed to the what we often call the forward primer, this primer going this way, and the copy that we made in the last reaction, you know, I'm going to actually put this in a slightly different color, so let's, let's draw this in a different color. So this is the copy, this is the copy, ignore this little line, I don't know why that happens, this is the copy, and then let's, say, let's make this in that color too because that's the same strand. This time it's going to have a primer that is complementary to it right here, like that. Okay, and this is what we often call the reverse primer. So this is called the forward primer, or the sense primer is the other thing, we call it sense. And this is the reverse, or the anti-sense primer. Okay, and then, of course, we're going to extend again. And what this means is we're going to make this copy going backwards along our previous copy, and it's going to fall off the end when it reaches the point where our other primer ended. And then this one is going to make another copy as well. And you'll notice that uh, this time, instead of having just two copies of our template after the first round, so after the first round, actually, let me just go through this. After the first round, we have two copies. We start off with one. After the first round, we have two. And now when we denature, again, we're going to have, you know where this is going. You're, we're going to have four copies. And you see this is exponential growth. So now when we go through this whole thing 40 times, we're going to have two to the 40th power copies. Okay, because you can imagine that each time this little orange line, this gets copied by the reverse primer, and the forward version gets copied by the forward primer. And if we just keep going and going and going, every time we're going to make a new copy until eventually we have a, a, a pool of DNA that is dominated by exactly the sequence between the forward primer and the reverse primer. You can have tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of copies of it, okay? And you can have tons and tons of copies of its, of its uh, complement, all right? And then we're going to go on and do something called gel electrophoresis, which I'm not going to talk about in this video, which you cannot read because my handwriting is just god-awful, but it's called gel electrophoresis. And that's going to show you that you got the right thing. And uh, I'll show you why and how. But this is PCR. It's actually really simple. You just need the polymerase that sits down and does the copying. You need the primer. You need the template. You need nucleotides to actually glom together into a strand of DNA. You need buffer and you need magnesium. And as long as all of those things are working well and you cycle things through temperature, 60 degrees, 72 degrees, 95 degrees, over and over again, it's going to work and it's going to give you a lot of copies.